So maybe to, to kick things off, I thought it would be great to just uh, introduce the audience a little bit to the origin stories, your backgrounds, how you got into venture, um, started your firms. Maybe Kirsten, if you could kick, kick us off. Sure. Thanks, Peter. And thanks for having me here today. And it's nice to speak to all of you. Um, so Forerunner raised our first institutional investment fund in 2012. Um, prior to that, the first investing that was done under the Forerunner headline was an angel fund that I launched in 2010. And um, in the two decades leading up to that, I have been an investor throughout my career, um, spent the first 10 years in the public markets, really fell in love with the markets, fell in love with investing, um, liked the, uh, the, the learning opportunity it afforded. And throughout my course of investing in, in public companies and, and really doing thesis-driven investing in the public markets, I got more and more interested in how the economy was evolving, how business was changing. And that kind of led me to private companies. And that kind of more curiosity led me to early stage companies where it really felt like the future was happening. Um, it was obvious, you know, it was as obvious as the early 2000s with the internet that technology was going to really evolve business in meaningful ways. And um, as an investor, I was eager to participate in that. And um, I think that combined with really finding uh, the opportunity that early stage investing is this combination of kind of having a view on the market and, and bringing analytics and business rigor, but also relating to, to people and to founders and playing a role in helping bring companies to life is an, an incredible job. Um, and so that was a, a bit of an inspiration for starting the business. And really in, in 2010, um, I think it was the start of a lot of evolution that's taken place over the last decade in particular in the venture industry. Um, you know, in, as of 2010, the venture industry was kind of 30 years old in earnest. And I think we'd been through some cycles and people were talking about lean startups and different ways to get companies started and funding. And, um, and I think people were kind of reevaluating um, what it took to be a great venture capitalist and what were the right formats to do it. And there was an advent kind of a few years leading up to that of more angel investors and more seed investors became a class of investing and some new firms sort of cropped up. And I think I got really excited about that evolution that was happening and felt like starting something from scratch was the best way to participate in it. Great. Uh, Jeff, you know, a little bit on, on your background, I mean, you've obviously founded Bedrock having been at, at Founders Fund, so I think you, you agree with some of what Kirsten's saying, but uh, maybe a little bit about, about, about your background and the origin into venture would be great, and then we can get into it. Absolutely. So it was a, thank you, Peter. So it was a very, a very unusual road into, into venture. So I actually started my career as a summer intern, as, as Peter uh, Ermo mentioned, I, I did grow up in Canada and started my career as a summer intern. Uh, up at uh, a Young and Shepherd at Procter and Gamble in 2000, summer of 2003, when I was uh, uh, going to the Queen's School of Business in the, in the Commerce program out in Kingston, and uh, ended up joining PG full time after graduation in Cincinnati, Ohio. I'm very, and that was around 2005, 2006, when Facebook was really starting to take off amongst my cohort of recent recent college grads, and was really um, was sort of really energized by that, um, and kept trying to convince my my superiors, my bosses at PNG, that we really had to start advertising on Facebook and no one would listen to me. So I was like, I have to get out of here. And so I negotiated a, I negotiated a transfer from Cincinnati to San Francisco and landed in San Francisco around 2007, right when, uh, right when this whole next wave of, uh, of technology, and at that time it was really consumer internet, uh, technologies were taking off and was, was basically just trying to build relationships. I was in this sort of technology transfer type role between P&G and Silicon Valley, I was 23 years old, and I was trying to build relationships between um, uh, uh, P&G and startups. Ended up networking my way uh, into meeting some of the folks affiliated with the PayPal mafia. Initially, uh, Max Levchin, who is the CTO of PayPal, uh, he introduced me to uh, to the folks uh, at the time running Clarion Capital, uh, one of whom, the founder of whom, was was Peter Thiel, and uh, they ended up convincing me to actually uh, go the investment route, and so I did a 180 away from, uh, from sort of technology, joined a hedge fund, uh, the hedge fund run by Peter Thiel uh, in 2008, 
two weeks before Lehman Brothers collapsed. And so my timing for uh, so I was convinced to not do technology and ended up at a hedge fund, uh, but uh, fell in love with, uh, with, with the art of investing and, and also with, never lost my, my entrepreneurial drive. So I ended up starting a, a technology startup with one of my colleagues at that hedge fund. That business uh, was Top Gas. Founders Fund was our earliest investor, uh, such that when we sold the business in late 2011, uh, Founders Fund invited me to join the, the team there. And, you know, I was still in my 20s and quite honestly, always anticipated I'd go back and start another start another startup. I mean, Top Guest was a, you know, was a single in baseball parlance. I don't know what the hockey equivalent analogy would be, but and I figured I wanted to go back and really try and build something meaningful, but ultimately just really fell in love with venture and uh, had a phenomenal five plus years as a partner at Founders Fund, um, got involved with amazing companies. Uh, led the first round in Lyft after they'd uh, sort of launched that new business, uh, served on the board of directors, uh, many, many other companies uh, around the world. And basically fast forward to 2017, uh, had sort of built this amazing track record, knew that venture is what I wanted to do for the rest of my, my career, uh, but never lost sort of my entrepreneurial desire and, and decided to team up with a longtime friend who I've now known for 11 years, an entrepreneur who I'd invested in and served on the board of directors of his company uh, via Founders Fund, Eric Stromberg, uh, to found Bedrock in late 2017. Uh, we manage now approximately half a billion dollars and really pursue a similar strategy to my strategy at Founders Fund, except in a much more stage focused uh, context. So really quite narrowly focused on early stage uh, and, uh, and more disciplined in terms of the number of companies in every portfolio, and we're, we're now on our second fund. Great, um, thanks, Jeff. And you know, both of you at SCS, we we have a barbell approach where we back you know some very established leaders, and and um, but really kind of like backing emerging firms. And I think I would categorize uh, Forerunner and Bedrock as as two of the most kind of exciting kind of new guard firms. Um, but when you think of the the venture ecosystem, um, you know Sequoia, Benchmark, Greylock, some of these firms have been around for for decades and have very well established brands. Um, what has it been like being, you know, being one of the kind of new guards and building the building a brand and competing um, with these very well established venture franchises? Um, I don't know, Kirsten, you want to kick kick off? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think one of the one of the key ingredients to, you know, if you can, if you could say we've had some early success in establishing our brand has been an approach like our startups. So every startup has an incumbent that they are uh, aspiring towards, think they have uh, a competitive advantage, something they can do better or different, but they still have to prove themselves in the context of that market and that competitive set. And, um, you know, we definitely, started our firm with a startup mentality. We have ambitions about where we're going. The biggest ambition is to be great disciplined investors and good partners to founders and to be high conviction investors and to use that to be able to make early investments. Um, but there's a process I think by which you earn your way into that. And we thought about having a wedge into the market. I think it's a lot of times when we're evaluating a company, we're thinking about what category are they participating in? What does the landscape look like? What are going to be their, you know, what, what is the big vision kind of five, 10 years out? And then pull it back to today and think about what's realistic to pull off today that you can do in a way that creates some noise in the market that starts to build some mind share and some credibility around your organization. And so we take that same approach as investors and said, you know, let's start somewhere, let's be fairly specific about it. Let's have a disciplined approach. Let's prove that we can do those things that we aspire to do on a bigger scale over time. Um, in general, Foreigner is a thesis driven of, uh, firm. You know, we believe in the quality or the impact of, of, of primary research to sort of help us shape where we're gonna spend our time and energy and focus. And then we also, you know, work hard to gain the necessary set of experiences or networks or insights that enable us to compete in those areas. But when you start and you're one general partner and one analyst, instead of trying to do that in 10 areas, we picked one. And early in my career, um, sort of my, my first job with, I feel like relevance to what I'm doing today, I was an equity research analyst and I followed retail companies. 
And so in some ways I've mapped that, that category of business for the last 20 years and have a real point of view on where it's going and a deep, uh, a deep history in the category and network. And so we took the thesis driven approach, we targeted in that area and really went to find the best of the best in those, in those that were operating you know, in, in, in new models and, and challenging that category in new ways. And then over time, we've started to take that same playbook and parlay it into other segments of themes. Um, and now, as as you did kindly and Mo in your introduction, you know, covered that we invest in you know a fairly broad range of companies. But there is common connective tissue in that we always have a thesis-driven approach. We really anchor it in the consumer. We lead with that as our kind of north star, if you will, and. Um, you know, per, pursue that with a disciplined approach. Yeah, and Jeff, I would certainly say your approach is is more opportunistic, right? As it relates to industries at Bedrock, and um, you know, how 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 would you contrast that with the the thesis driven um, sector approach that Kirsten takes at, at Forerunner? Absolutely. So it's, it's a combination of opportuni opportunism and, and thesis driven work on our end. Uh, you know, saying that, that we often refer to here at Bedrock is that when the facts change, we change our minds. And so you always want to be, be open to, to new opportunities and, and new areas. And the basic, the basic genesis of us, the sort of more opportunistic strategy for us is I actually would echo a lot of the stuff Kirsten, Kirsten said. I, I think she, she made some really good points. The, the basic view we have here is that Venture is a is a is a is a is sort of an asset class that it's just it's it's relatively easy to enter, uh, but it's incredibly hard to be to be successful at. And I just spent uh, having spent a number of years at a firm, Founders Fund, quite frankly, that when I joined was not a top tier firm, was not seen as a a number one brand. It was an emerging manager when I joined in 2012, and just knowing how we had to brute force our way um into into the best companies. That was this constant search for things that, that other investors weren't looking at. Um, we've really sort of brought that to bear at Bedrock. And so I'd say that the approach on our end, uh, initially, when we first launched the firm in late 2017, uh, we closed our first fund, launched it really formally in, in early 2018. It was really leveraging the relationships I built at Founders Fund with a handful of top entrepreneurs. So specifically, the Lyft founders, where I was you know, worked very close with them on the board for many years. Rig Up, which is a marketplace for labor, initially in oil and gas. Thank goodness they've expanded over the years into all sorts of skilled trade work. So, uh, you know, uh, renewable energy, defense, construction, that founder, Shen, uh, the Wish founders, really leaning on them to basically, A, um, give us allocations into some of those companies. So Rig Up, for example, is one of our largest positions at Bedrock. It's a crossover investment where I initially led it at Founders Fund, and then we've We've led a number of rounds alongside Founders Fund via Bedrock. The Athletic would be another where we teamed up with Founders Fund to co-lead around. That's an opportunity we sourced, uh, brought it to Founders Fund, subscription sports media. So really leveraging my affiliation with Founders Fund initially uh, such that we could really get into top deals uh, through partnering with that firm early on uh, and then using that as a springboard uh, into really building a universe and, and brand of our own. Uh, that, that founders can really get behind. And it's been this combination of just the founders we've backed in the past vouching for us. So some of those folks that I've mentioned, and in many cases, we go back, you know, nine, 10 years uh, with these entrepreneurs, uh, coupled with the agility, and Chris, uh, Kirsten spoke to this, with the agility of a really small team. So there are just two of us on the investment committee here. That enables us to uh, do our analysis uh, much more quickly. Uh, and, um, and, uh, and a sense that uh, the entrepreneurs where we get a lot of our inbound, they know what we're looking for. We're looking for these companies that cut against the popular narrative uh, that, uh, that somehow are being overlooked or underestimated uh, by, the, by the market at large. And then, you know, the last thing I'd say on sort of old guard versus new guard is every, every 10 years or so, there does seem to be uh, a, new, a new old guard. So, you know, the, the old guard becomes the, the, the old guard goes away and there's a new old guard. And, and you know, I, I certainly was part of that. I was part of that changing of the guard at Founders Fund over, over my, my many years there. And I really do feel like a similar dynamic is happening now. And so certainly 
I, you know, when I started Founders Fund 2012, I'd never heard of Kirsten. Now her name comes up all the time, forerunner. She's seen as, you know, quite frankly, an established manager on par with these, with these names that have been around for, for many decades. And, and it is this very dynamic uh, asset class where, um, yes, the brand is very important, but the, the new brands can rise very quickly and overtake, overtake old brands that can happen uh, in, in a short period of time, which is why it's such an interesting, interesting asset class to compete in from my vantage point. And yeah, it's a great always point. be competing, right, Jeff? So we oh, want to stay it's relevant. It is hyper competitive. I, mean, I think that's one of the things about this business that I love is that you just, you can't run the same playbook. You have to keep like pushing your thinking forward. You have to figure out how to use the experience you've had and the commonalities and the lessons to become you know, a more effective board member or more effective at, at, at sussing out opportunities. But you have to keep an open mind. You can't invest in the same company or the same model you did, you know, even yesterday. Because like things are evolving and changing. And I guess, you know, as Jeff points out, it's a good point. So are kind of, you know, where the puck is moving on how people view venture firms. So it's on us to, you know, to, to keep pushing that. Um, and at the end of the day, I do think that like returns are what's going to build a brand, you know? And so like, yeah. we're all, we're all working to build that track record. And as you start to accumulate that, like that's leverage in the market. Yeah. I mean, I imagine Kirsten is probably getting a lot easier to win and compete now that you're so established. I mean, you can probably go head to head with the Sequoias, the Excels, et cetera now versus when when you were when you were starting i mean have you i still have work to do i'd love yeah. to tell this audience i win every single time but we still have work to do and actually honestly like that's okay i i, I expect to always have work to do there's always going to be new competitors and we're always going to have to keep upping our game just how it is and how much how how you know people always talk about brand and venture capital and how important is kind of the the brand for if you're if you're if you put yourself in the company's shoes, getting being associated with with a top tier brand, which is going to help you, um, you know, raise, you know, raise raise subsequent rounds, hire talent. Um, it just you know if Sequoia's in or Forerunners in, you know that that says that real smart money's um, you know decided to back your company. Uh, versus, you know, kind of value added, uh, you know, board advice. Um, you know, one thing I hear people say is, you know, the, the dirty secret in venture is that the best companies, you know, need the least, you know, need the least kind of handholding and then also valuation, right? You know, do you want to take, you know, a forerunner discount, a bedrock discount? Um, you know, there's a few different things at play, but um, say when you are, uh, when you're when you're when you're counseling your your existing companies and having them think about uh, you know their next round of financing and who to bring in, what are some of the things that you think companies should look for? I mean, I'm sure it might vary company to company, but what are some of the things that you look for in you know the other venture partners you want to bring onto the cap tables you have? I mean, sure. it's a good question. It's a layered question. I think to start with the first one, which is um, how to you know. How do I, like, what does brand mean in venture capital? I think you could get 10 founders on stage and five of them would tell you they would pick the single person that they work with as above all. And the other five would tell you that they would pick the brand and the platform. So there's the, the good news. And that's where, you know, it opens the opportunity for competition. Um, ideally, you could be both. Then you could just you know, that that's, I think, what, you know, Jeff and I are striving for. Um, but I think, you know, different people prioritize different things. Um, Jeff, do you feel differently or? I would, I would agree with, I, I, I would tend to agree with that. You know, I, 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 the nuance, I think, on the brand with the firms is ultimately, uh, the, I think the brand in VC is really ultimately just what companies has the, has the, has the individual person at the firm invested in. That's really, that's brand. That's what drives brand is what companies has Kirsten from Forerunner invested in. And then you can ultimately create a halo for your firm from the companies and the individual 
partner at a firm is invested in. And so I'd say the, the brands are actually far less uh, entrenched than, than, one, than one might think. And I think there's maybe one exception that proves the rule, which is Sequoia. So there's sort of this, this one counter example where they, they have this machine that's endured for five decades and, and, uh, and, and, and they've, they've, there may be the exception that proves the rule. And I would say outside of them, uh, it really is a, uh, sort of a, well, what companies is the person invested in? So like, you know, when we were getting the firm off the ground, uh, 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 we would have folks reach out to me being like, oh, you're the guy from, from South America. So I, we led, you know, I, I was the, on the board of directors of New Bank, which has sort of been the largest venture story in South America over the last five years. And folks would know me as like the Latin America FinTech guy, even though I'd only done one investment there and would, would reach out, even though we didn't really have a brand day one with Bedrock, it, it took time to build up. So it's, I think it is this personal chemistry thing with entrepreneurs uh, secondarily, and then primarily it's, well, what companies has the, has the given uh, partner invested in? And then the last thing I'd say is it is a highly networked industry and in that um, if, a, if an individual partner has a, has a negative reputation or is, has, gets mixed reviews from, from founders, that percolates out very quickly um, in, into, the, into the market amongst entrepreneurs. And so it is just this constant um, you know, relationship by relationship type dynamic with the, with the entrepreneurs that drive the brand over, over sort of many decades. Yeah. And, and to your and question about like, how do we think about follow on investors? I mean, I think thinking about like, what does the company need, right? So mm -hmm. I hope we're generally series A investors. So one of the goals we have is to be pretty close to that founder. At that point, when we're investing, there's a small team. Hopefully what you're getting is somebody who can talk about strategy, about priorities, about milestones, goals, like, you know, a whole range of things. Um, perhaps if you got that relationship as a founder with one of your investors, the next time you're looking for somebody who complements that, and maybe there's a particular, you know, a particular industry skill set, or there's a particular, you know, category of companies you, you want to do business with that they can help you unlock. I think being strategic like that um, is worth giving, giving thought to at, at every step of the way. And then of course there's deal dynamics. Um, so I think they get weighted. Yeah. And, you know, Jeff, Jeff, one thing you said, you know, how when people come to Bedrock, they know they're basically, it's, it's you and Eric and you can make decisions quickly. And there's been this rise of, um, you know, the solo capitalist, uh, you know, right now that, that, you know, founders know they're just talking to the one individual and they don't need to, they don't need to deal with the politics of a VC firms, et cetera. Um, I guess the, the, the question that I have um, a little bit actually is more for Kirsten, which is how have you thought about scaling, you know, Forerunner over time and maybe, and, you know, I, you know, because, you know, initially it was, it was you and Yuri and, and you're now you're really building out. So, so talk to me a little bit about the evolution of the team, you know, still relatively nimble by, by certain firm standards, but, you know, getting, getting larger than, than uh, Jeff is at Bedrock at this point in time. We're really applying a bottoms up approach. You know, we've thought every time a, a combination about where do we think the opportunity is in the market and how do we think we're set up to meet it? and let's get the fund that sets us up to hopefully outperform. Um, and I think that we've been fortunate as a team, a, a small team, albeit I think a mighty team. And I think that ambitious people who, who are ready to go and have ideas and things they want to invest in make us feel more confident about our ability to put together dynamic portfolios and continue to compete in a broader range. And and as we've considered that and thought about, okay, where are there sweet spots in the market? Um, you know, interestingly, there's kind of a, a barbell in the market, like there is in almost every business category where there's a lot of individual, there's everything from individual angels to accelerators to sub hundred million dollar funds that are generally competing for that first round of funding. And then there are the kind of been around for decades, have built up a track record and have the flexibility and opportunity and have earned the right to be raising multi-strategy funds or large funds. And they're, you know, maybe investing across the spectrum, but they're able to do a lot of later stage stuff as well. 
And so in a lot of ways, we felt like, gosh, classic, like series A, series B is, it's certainly not an unpopulated area, but to be able to bring focus to it and to think about how do we get all eyes on serving that segment of the market and challenge ourselves to find companies at that time felt like um, something that our team was prepared to run after, wanted to run after, and was available in the market. And then we thought, okay, what does it take from a dollar standpoint to compete for the best in class series A on a, like a round size? And how do you think about portfolio construction with that deal in mind and building some flexibility around that? Build a model come up with a number. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, as I told, I mean, as we've had a conversation at each time we've been back out in market, um, right now we've been on a path of increasing our fund size because of the various components of what I just described. But mm -hmm. maybe things change. And next time we're back out with a smaller size or maybe it's a meaningfully big, I mean, I, I think that it's like really staying in tune with like, where the market is, where the opportunity is, and where you think you're set up to succeed, and then making sure you're capitalized in a way to do that. Yeah. Well, I think you, as you remember when we first started to get get to know each other, I I, I was probably one of the only LPs telling you I thought you were undercapitalized. You were. Um, you were the only one. Yeah. You were right because we've had, we've raised top off funds on on top of all of those funds because there were great companies in there, and you know I think. It's a it's a it's a balancing act, all of it, of course. Um, just I want to ask, ask one question, and then I'll pivot a little bit. But um, you know, thinking about, I was, I was going to ask a question. You know, Jeff, what have you learned from? You know, you worked with Peter Thiel for for many years. A very kind of interesting, contrarian thinker. Um, love to hear maybe some of the key takeaways from that, and then ask both of you about you know what what's your kind of most non-consensus uh, viewer idea today I know that I think that's an interview question that Peter probably um, hit you with when you were when you're interviewing with at Clarium or Founders Fund but but I want to hear Kirsten's take too but I'll kick it over to you first Jeff sure well yeah I, I, I never actually was asked that I never actually was asked that question but I mean the, and the one rule with the question is actually the only correct way to answer it is to not answer it. So that's actually the, but I, but I will answer it. That's first. what you learned. That's good advice. I'm taking that down. <laughs> the only, the only I always part, answer. The only that's my problem. I shouldn't give it answer. away. Uh, because to the extent you actually uh, do believe something that's truly non-consensus, if it would actually, so the, so the only right answers are ones that would, would really alarm the audience. It would be sort of really, uh, would be, would be really concerning if, if it's truly non-consensus. But you know, you know, from, I'd say, I'd say from Peter, um, Really, it's about first principles thinking and, and looking at every um, every opportunity from first principles, every market from first principles. Like, what's what is the company specific story, and and uh, and um, and not trying to like pattern match or extract lessons from like one market or category to another. And so, you know, when I was looking at Lyft very early on, it was within my first few months at Founders Fund. They just had a few dozen cars in San Francisco with these crazy mustaches. And they were the only company doing peer-to-peer -peer ride sharing, regular people driving other regular people. Uber was a black, just a black car business back then. And, um, and there was no sort of analog for that. And so it was sort of like learning from Peter how to think about a peer-to-peer -peer ride uh, transportation business model, what that would look like from a first principle standpoint, and then applying that sort of first principles thinking again and again and again, quarter after quarter, in the context of, of different investments and and different markets. And so that'd be part one. Uh, you know, I'd say that if, I, if I'm forced to answer your non-consensus question, Peter, um, I'd say that the thing I believe right now that I think is very non-consensus is that um, basically if you look at sort of uh, ge geopolitics and, and sort of um, the formation of countries over the last 25 years, there've only been five new countries founded over the last 25 years. And so you have um, you have like uh, Serbia, Montenegro, um, South Sudan, Sudan Kosovo, um, and uh, there've been five new countries over 25 years. I think we're we're going to have five new countries over the next five years, five plus. And so I think we're in a we're entering a phase of massive geopolitical flux. I think there is an opportunity for um, the private sector and, and technology specifically in this shift amongst with charter cities and sort of other opportunities 
And I think all of this flux means that one very interesting place to be investing right now uh, is defense technology. And, and, and you've actually done that in the, in the bedrock portfolio. And, and, uh, and, um, and so it's, it's basically that I think things are far more unstable globally than, uh, than most people believe. Very cool. Maybe That's I'll- a good actually, answer, Jeff. So, yeah. Peter, about how about you give me a different question? <laughs> <laughs> If you don't want to, we can, we can, we can shift gears. Oh, I, it's no, okay. I'm, I'm hold I mean, I, I'm I'll hold tell you what, I have a non-consensus idea. Um, there's a, he, one of the, it's maybe not as interesting as Jeff's, but one of the biggest themes in venture right now has been remote work. You know, everybody's jumping on everything for remote work. If you've got a video conferencing this or that, like game on. If you've got a software tool that means you never have to sit in the same room again, like, term sheets are flying at your face. I actually think there's a lot of really important tools that can be you that that are being built that that will be used regardless of whether there's remote work or not. So I'm not ditching on that whole space at all, but I actually think that like this year has definitely shown us that people can work differently than we have before and they can do it effectively. But I don't think everyone wants to work by themselves in some hold up location. I think people like to collaborate. I think people like to be in the room and get the energy off of each other and get the flow going. This is great. I'm happy to see you today, Peter and Jeff, and have this conversation. But it's going to be a lot more fun when we can do it in person next year. And I think that's true for work, too. So you know, I think if everybody's, you know, trying to figure out how everyone's going to scatter shot across the world and not be in the same location again, and, you know, leaning into every kind of technology that supports that, I'm, I'm probably going to let other people invest in that. And I, and I, I, I also agree with that. However, I don't think it's going to be, I, I, I think this, the time frame on this thing is a lot longer than everyone thinks. So I actually don't think it's going to be next year. Basically, to get back together in person, uh, safely on a sort of day-to-day -day basis, you need the rapid antigen testing, mass produced at mass scale, or you need, uh, or you need to get to basically herd immunity either through a vaccine or the virus going through the population. And so, I actually, my 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 my, my other non-consensus view is we're looking at three, basically three more years of a uh, of a real pandemic raging, and uh, at least in the United States, that would be a non-consensus negative negative view on things here. I hope you're wrong on that. I'm wrong. glad that I've gotten to know you all. Well <laughs> I hope first, you're wrong because I, I really want to go back to the. I hope so too. Yeah, I miss, I miss, I miss, I miss uh, both of you. Uh, miss you too. And maybe just just riffing on that a little bit, like, what are you talk talk a little bit about um, what it's like to try to close founders remotely? You know, doing deals. Um, you know, how your companies are handling kind of remote work. Um, you know, what what is kind of durable, like long lasting shifts. You know, I, I personally think the, the idea that San Francisco's dead or that New York's dead is totally, I, I don't know, I, I take the other side of that. Um, but, you know, maybe uh, Jeff, you know, being in Hawaii right now, you know, imagine you're looking at some new deals, you're probably not, you know, going down to meet the people in person, like talk, talk to it. And, and Kirsten, I love that you're kind of how you're coping with the uh, current situation, because the activity doesn't seem to slow down much, at least from our perspective. It's accelerated. It's accelerated. Yeah, I mean, the way that we're looking at it here would be um, re really uh, the, the last number of investments we've made are companies where we've known the, known the entrepreneurs yeah. for, in many cases, several quarters. And so that typically is how we operate. We'll, we'll get to know a founder an opportunity over several quarters, um, have multiple interactions, multiple in-person meetings historically before investing. And so I think there's only one investment we've made, even though we've been very active over the last two quarters, there's only one investment we've made where we, where one of us on the investment uh, committee hadn't spent sort of, you know, at least a few hours with the entrepreneur live face to face. How we're doing it going forward is um, we actually, uh, we will, we are meeting entrepreneurs in person for, for, for large investments. And so I would echo what Kirsten had to say around. It is hard to make these really important business decisions. And certainly whether you want to invest millions or tens of millions of dollars in a company and vice versa, so whether a given entrepreneur wants to work with a given VC is a really important decision. We do think that that needs to happen for the most part in person. And so, you know, entrepreneurs will, are flying out here. 
you know, I'll be I'll be going to, to California uh, shortly to, to meet to meet entrepreneurs. So it's not like we're doing no in person, but the bar is just much higher. And we're front loading a lot of the analysis and quite frankly, anchored more toward things that come in network versus just cold out of the blue our way, just speaking honestly, uh, in this in this context that we're in. Um, I will say that like COVID, I do think it and this is not a contrarian view at all. It's, I think, quite consensus among VC, but it really was like a 10-year accelerant on a lot of technology-driven trends that were already happening. So this move towards a more remote working environment sort of already happening. Um, the, the, uh, and this, all of these other trends were already having to accelerate it by 10 years. And so it's basically the framing on what it means for us as, as, as venture capitalists is... Um, Basically, I think it corrected what retrospectively was a mispricing in the market uh, for all of these te technology assets. And so you could argue that because everything's been sped up 10 years or so, uh, the mispricing had to get corrected and it, it got corrected very quickly. And so, um, so yeah, I mean, it is, uh, it's difficult to operate. I think the companies we're invested in uh, would echo what Kirsten has to say, where they're sort of itching to get back together in person more. And then at the same time, I do think a lot does move out of, I don't think any of these cities are dead. I don't believe in the death of any of these cities, but I do think that certain shifts are irreversible. So for example, engineering, which historically has been very centered in Silicon Valley uh, and extraordinarily high cost. You have, this, you have this geographically constrained labor market with engineering for these Silicon Valley tech companies driven by Google, Facebook, Apple, where the salaries got exorbitant, the perks got just absolutely exorbitant, um, and, uh, and basically led to this tremendous sense of entitlement within the engineering uh, labor market in the San Francisco Bay Area. And the founders that we work with, now that they're like, we can hire engineers from anywhere, like that's not going to revert back to engineering teams being in the Bay Area. That is a permanent shift of like remote work for engineering. Now, will executive teams want to be together again? And like, is the most obvious center of gravity San Francisco Bay Area? Yes. Um, so I do think it does stay, stay there, but at the same time, you know, when I started out in tech with my startup in 2010, no one was based in SF, almost everyone was in the South Bay. And then over the, the next few years, everyone moved up to San Francisco. If things can shift, they might, they might shift only, only a few hours. Maybe it all shifts to Reno or Tahoe or, or something <laughs> like that. But, uh, but anyways, I'll, I'll stop rambling here. Harrison, what are you seeing what, in terms of uh, new investments? Have you made any investments yet without meeting in person? I was thinking about that while Jeff was talking. I think we've made one. We've met one. Yeah. And now we are kind of, um, we are going and taking walks outside and, and spending time with people in person. I mean, when you are making a Series A investment, you are making a bet on that leader. Like, you you you, you know, I think, Smart, disciplined investors have a view on the market. They know what category they're investing in. They know what's possible in the realm of business in that segment and how a business model stands to unfold and some opportunities in that regard. But you are looking, you know, you are considering that leader and their ability to translate that vision into action, attract resources to what they're doing and create and direct priorities and your ability and, and what the quality of your working relationship might be. And there is a lot of it that you can accomplish over video. We've tried to, instead of having, you know, deep long dive meetings, we've tried to have, we've broken them up a little bit more so that you can have kind of a video interaction and then a phone interaction. And then maybe you're exchanging some thoughts on email. So you're kind of, you know, creating some, some dynamics so you can kind of see like how that, threads together and holds together. Um, but, you know, I do think that um, it's a missing element if you don't spend time with somebody in person. Yeah. Um, just one kind of question that I, I have um, thinking about, you know, the past and, and, you know, you think of the, the, the bubble bursting in, in 2000, um, and you know now certainly you know valuations are very high, but um, you know how how is how is today's environment like different? You know what are you kind of observing in the valuations in the private market, and then you know some of the things that are happening 
in in the public market, you know, as it relates to some of the new tools in the toolkit, whether it's SPACs, direct listings, things things like that. Um, any kind of quick observations? Well, I was working in the public markets at the time of that 2000 crash. And I think that, you know, the internet was new. It was a whole new frontier. And people let dreams and, um, you know, hyperbole kind of drive a lot of that. And so, you know, I remember distinctly um, working among my colleagues and just feeling like a little bit left out of the investing activity because I just couldn't underwrite any of these investments. I mean, they just were not underwritable from a math standpoint. There was no model to build. It was all on the come and it was all on the dream and the vision of the internet. And that's what drove that cycle. Today's cycle is driven by something entirely different. We all know the internet. That doesn't mean we know the future, but we know like this new playing field that we're living in. We know the capabilities of digital. We have a good idea of the adoption. We know the ways in which it can be used. We've seen it influencing business now for two decades. We're actually at a place where it's, it's pretty mature. And I think that what you're seeing in the market is that like there's a reconciliation going on around that where you look at the public markets and you look at the majority of the market cap in the public markets and they really truly are old guard companies. And I don't say that with you know disrespect for those companies, but they had business models that were based on entirely different foundational elements and entirely different operations that were about you know an economy pre-internet. And they've been pulling threads forward, but the business model in many cases, you know, isn't fully modernized and it can't be fully modernized. You know, I think about those companies that I'm referring to, like these, you know, bigger public companies that, that people have been trading in and out of in the stock market for years, like they were growth companies at one point, you know, then they were value companies, which is probably where they've lived for the last handful of years. And now I think I would argue that they're like, you know, on the decline because value still needs to have some look to the future. And so if you're a public market investor thinking about where to put your money and you're thinking about the economy is going to look like in 10 years, there is a dearth of things to invest in, which is why the FANG or the five, those five companies are like 20% of the market cap of the entire market. I mean, they're awesome companies. You know, no one I don't think would disagree but are they that good? Part of it is because there's just no supply, but the demand is growing over here. Meanwhile, we've been keeping companies private for a lot longer. The public, the, the private market funding cycles have gotten a lot longer as there's been more capital coming into the private markets. You can raise a series F or series G before you go public, right? And so this year, you know, there's a confluence of things that happen where you start to like run up against those points of friction. And a few companies start to go public and look at people, see the energy behind them. They see a snowflake and what happens, a snowflake is a company, not a rare event, it's a company that went public. Um, but, you know, they, they see a few of these things happen and they think that, you know, I think, I think people are waking up to this evolution and that like what's trapped in the, private markets are not startup companies. They are established companies that are meaningful to the economy that can move on to the next chapter. And maybe we got to move a few of these along a bit faster. So when I think about like the next decade, I think it gets ruled by just a, 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 role, a, a changing of the guard in the markets. Um, yeah, that's great. Um, you know, just shifting gears a little bit, we had a question come in that, you know, maybe we can bring, bring this back to portfolio companies a little bit. Um, and it was really about, you know, the, the value add that, you know, VCs can have, um, you know, on, on, their, on their portfolio companies. Um, and, you know, maybe I'll like, Kirsten, you know, Glossier is one that, you know, I've, I've heard Emily sing your praises before. Um, it's a very, very interesting company. Maybe, maybe it'll be going public 2021. Who knows? You know, possibly. Everybody's kind uh, of thinking could, about it now. They it, weren't thinking it could, about I, it I saw something in the now. news the other day about, but, but, 
you know, I, I've kind of heard it from Emily, but but how how do you see yourself as being one of her early supporters there? And then um, Jeff, I'll, I want you to I'll, I'll let you go go. But let's, Kirsten, I'd love to hear your thoughts on okay. on what you your your value out of Galassia. Okay, thanks for the question. I mean, truly, every interaction, it, it, I think you're you know, it, it's personal to each company and it's personal to the dynamic of between, you know, yourself and the founder and what the founder needs. Glossier in some ways was, um, you know, it, unusual in its own way, it stood out. Emily, the founder, Glossier is a company that um, sells its own brand of makeup. And it's kind of known in the market for having created a new movement where they've in some ways co-collaborated on this journey with their customer. They've been very engaged kind of across digital social channels with their audience. And, um, and they, they struck a chord and that's been, you know, a, 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 a very, um, a, 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 a solid underpinning for the business and something unique that has tangible ways it gets executed. It's, you know, data, it's analyzing that, it's using that information to be that much more thoughtful about what products you're launching, et cetera. There's a little background on what the company is so people know. But um, I met Emily when she had an idea. She had previously had a blog and she had um, kind of out of that experience had a lot of observations about how the beauty market was changing, how the customer was changing and where there was a mismatch between what was available and how products were being sold um, and where the demand was. And um, she had about five, maybe seven ideas on how she was gonna address this. And actually she was going to do all of them to address it. And what kind of caught my imagination was, I thought many of her ideas, if not most of them were really credible um, and I was really impressed with the fact that she had gone out and gotten all this experience on her own. You know, one of the things you're looking for is like, can somebody have an idea and an inkling and then actually put action behind it? And like when they do put action behind it, what happens and what sort of results do they deliver? She was one person. She had a camera. She had a notepad. She created a blog with over a million unique visitors and a million month of revenue, which was like basically straight to the bottom line to her. And out of all of that, she came and she said, I've been on a journey with this consumer for the last 16 months. Here are the 10 things I've observed about them. And here are the ways in which there's opportunities to address that. And I was really impressed with that get up and go and that ability to be constructive, like literally in, on her own. And so we had a lot of conversation about what she wanted to build and ultimately, um, I think the first, you know, kind of uh, bonding advice was around um, the power of focus, which I, I, I brought that to the conversation, which is to say, I love all these ideas. I love the idea of putting all these ideas together and really thinking about a big company. But I also believe you got to start somewhere. So let's take that big vision and walk it back to today and think about where is a really solid place to enter the market and start to establish the company. And we sort of, you know, we had a meeting of the minds around that through a six month period of talking. And I built conviction up in her and our partnership. And she came back to me and said, let's start with a product. I know how to make a product. I know what they want. I know what the margin on it is. And from there, we can think about how we bring in community aspect or how we bring in third party selling or how we advance the model on retailing. Um, and so that became the genesis for the investment. A great story, Jeff. Um, how about how about rig up? You know, that's one that we're directly invested in. Hasn't it's been an interesting year for the company? Can you talk, talk to me about your your involvement there. Obviously, it predates predates Bedrock, right? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, rig ups had a had a very interesting year in that uh, uh, it, it it historically is a business that primarily was a a provider of labor in the in the oil and gas industry, but now at this point, uh, is basically a two-sided labor marketplace across all skilled trades. You could think of it as something like a fiber type business, except actually uh, bigger scale than fiber at this point, although it's public, a uh, private company uh, focused on skilled trade labor instead of these sort of quick freelance gig jobs. So think about 
uh, someone doing a major uh, industrial solar panel installation or constructing, uh, doing, doing a, a construction project in the defense, defense industry, they're doing a lot in maritime right now. So across all of these different skilled trade verticals. And when I first got involved in that business, analogous to Kirsten, although the, the Kirsten story is, I think, very special and th th that type of story is very rare. Uh, but somewhat analogously, um, we, um, you know, I met the founders when it was just a, a deck and, and an idea and basically was really drawn, I think, similar to Kirsten. There was this really unique founder specific story on, on why they'd be sort of uniquely positioned to, to build this. They had a vision no one else had. In the case of Rig Up, Shen, the founder, first generation immigrant, uh, son of Ch uh, the owners of a Chinese restaurant in small town Texas, grew up in small town Texas went to Texas A&M, became best friends with sort of one of the Texas A&M quarterbacks, this guy, Mike Witte. And uh, then Shen uh, went on to New York to become an oil trader at Citadel. Uh, Mike uh, became a petroleum engineer. And uh, through his work at Citadel, Shen just identified that the way that labor uh, was, was sort of flowing, the, the labor flows in oil and gas were really inefficient. There was an opportunity to use software to really create a a labor marketplace that would result in um, in folks uh, being able to get more work and more efficiency for ENPs initially, et cetera, and, and really had mapped out the entire vision. And there was this unique yin and yang between Shen and Mike and this unique ability to penetrate uh, at the time the oil and gas industry, given their backgrounds, similar to it sounds like Emily at Glossier, just having that unique lens on beauty from her blog. And so you're always looking, I think, for this founder specific story. And then with Rig Up, it was really all along the way working, working pretty closely with them on strategic decisions, where to focus, where to not, um, uh, positioning on the company. And so the latest, I guess, quote unquote, value add thing I've done as a board member there now, really since day one, has been uh, we're, we're, we're changing the name of the company to reflect the fact that it is well beyond oil and gas at this point, away from Rig Up. And I actually came up with the new names. They'd hired this this naming agency, this branding agency, they came up with like 500 names. The founders didn't like any of them. And I, and I came up with a new name and we tested it and it scored through the roof with, uh, with all of the core constituents. And so, uh, so that's sort of one example. And, you know, the value- remind, all, me, re remind me what it is? It's work rise, work rise. Yeah. Right. yeah. So, so there's, it's always company specific, but, uh, but you always want to sort of under promise and over deliver. And, you can always add the most value and like Kirsten, you've been involved from the very, very beginning of the, of the story. Um, one other question I just want to ask, and it's, I think it's applicable for Kirsten particularly, but, uh, you know, how should venture capital change? You know, I, I know you've been very involved with the All Raise initiative, you know, to, just wanted to make sure I didn't, I'd be remiss if I didn't, you know, talk about that, you know, today, you know, I think, yeah. Personally, I feel like there needs to be more representation, whether it's, you know, females, minorities, Canadians. <laughs> in don't venture count. Capital. Don't count. Don't count. I mean, I think, you know, I think that like um, the startup ecosystem is aspiring to build the companies that shape our economy and our lives for the next decades to come. And those companies are going to be serving a very diverse U.S. population and increasingly a global population. And so thinking from the very beginning about that diversified audience and understanding your market and those dynamics is essential for companies. And one way of doing that is having that, represent, that diversity represented on your executive team and on your network of supporters, investors being one. So I think that like everybody benefits when we have a more well-rounded perspective at the table. And um, it's been, honestly, like it's been, we can talk about it being frustrating that there's not enough females or there's not enough diversity. I'm gonna focus on the fact that like in three short years, we're making material progress. And I'm hopeful that continues. I think you do need a snowball effect. You know, you need to have, um, there needs to be role models, there needs to be success stories and case studies and we are, we are getting, the, they're happening. And I think more people are feeling like they can see themselves in this industry. I think founders are recognizing it. They're certainly recognizing it for their own teams. They need to be thinking about it also for their investor groups. LP should be thinking about it too. It's just smart investing. 
it's just smart investing because it's on pace with the future. Um, and I think that, um, you know, it's encouraging that there's progress. It would be great if it could happen faster, but it, there's, there is, there is progress happening. Great, Jeff. Any 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 thoughts or, or views? I mean that that all that all sounds very very right to me. It is this it is this this very real this very real issue, and and um and then it is just uh this sort of uh uh it, it's a very real problem, and it it uh it's something that we were all we're all working on in the industry. Yeah. Well, this has been this has been great. Um, I really, really appreciate uh, the two of you taking the time, um, Mo for uh, and Prime Quadrant for for setting this all up. Uh, but I, I, I can't wait to see you all in person. It's it's it's. I'm glad we've back to that to theme. Build. Me too. I know. We're gonna go I visit know. Jeff, and he's in Hawaii, I know. right? That's what I Jeff, he's coming over. Doors are, doors are open. <laughs> uh, thank so thanks, thank guys. you. Yeah, and uh, you know. Kristen, Jeff, Peter, that was just fantastic. I, I can't thank you enough for sharing your both enlightening and enjoyable comments with us. We really appreciate your generosity in uh, of time and, and, and of wisdom and certainly hope to do it again soon. And I think Kirsten volunteered Jeff for a year from now. So- um, All right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, point out, uh, but really uh, thank you again and for all our participants thank you for joining us if you have not yet donated please do please do so um by going to the donate page at the top right of the website and clicking on the link that was sent to you um lastly we'd love your feedback on how to make these sessions better every time so please complete the survey at the bottom of the page or on the link that you'll get thanks again for your participation in lunches with legends and the important charitable projects <laughs>